is a dinner here, um, and the Legion is putting it on for us. Um, we're having a spaghetti dinner, and uh, Ed has informed me that I have to say all these wonderful things that I'm not prepared to do, but I can do this. Um, I'm going to talk about the seminars. Today we have Tim Clock. He's on first, talking about Chainsaw 101. And then after him, we have Aaron Booker, um, who will be finishing sculptures using painting techniques. I mean, I think these are people that most of you are aware of, and I think you're going to be impressed with some of the things they have to say. Then tomorrow we have Jeff Moore, and um, he's, he's a fabulous carver too, and he's got some interesting beyond tools and techniques. And then we have um, Jason Stoner, who's going to be doing spirit faces. That's tomorrow. And then tomorrow night for dinner, you are on your own. Please check your, your packets. There's lots of coupons in there. There's coupons from Sheets for lunch. There's coupons from Jordan's for dinner. I think it's $12.50. So um, please check your packets. There, there, you know, there's ways to get dinner tomorrow. And then um, Wednesday, we're going to have Scott Dow with an open discussion on sculpture and chainsaw carving. And of course, Alan, who does all of our marketing for the Rendezvous, um, will be doing a marketing your business. Thursday, we have Mark Bosworth in how to make carvings come to life. And then Aya Blaine on how to approach a detailed portrait of a dog. So I think we got some great seminars this year. And then at the dinner on, thir on, on Saturday at Alios, Brian Sprague will be doing a presentation for us because he is featured on our shirt this year. And every year, we try to pick someone who has done something for chainsaw carving throughout the years. And I think Brian has been to every rendezvous since day one, since before it even went live. So, um, yeah, so he, he really is a, a staunch supporter of, of the arts and, and what we're doing. So today, I, I'd like to go back to Tim and say some funny things about Tim. <laughs> no, not funny, but Tim, everybody knows Tim. He came to me last year and said, look, so many people ask me about starting, their, about all these things that you do, so I'm volunteering to do a seminar on Chainsaw 101, and I think it's gonna be very informative, very entertaining, and done by Tim, who has just been, Tim has come a long way. When you first started coming here, how many years? Uh, 2004. 2004. And looking at what you do now and the way you travel the world and bring your art to these people, you, you have just done amazing things. Beautiful carving. Because I knew about it, but it was a handful of carvers and I just didn't feel like I was worthy. And I've gotten over that. Uh, everybody kind of needs to get over that because uh, the more you experience other carvers, the better carver you're going to be. Okay? We're all like, we learn bits and pieces from everywhere and we kind of make ourselves out of everything that we've ever seen, everything we've ever heard. We kind of comprise that into our work every day. But, uh, but uh, let me see. So the first, uh, the first thing is, uh, for anybody, how many new carvers do we have? Right on. And how many uh, guys making a living pro carvers up here? Pro carvers? Y'all can leave, man. This is one on one, dude. This is one on one. You're going to be bored for the next time. we got to keep you honest. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the first thing is, uh, if you're, if you're going to enter it into this business, uh, it's all about love. It really is. Your family's going to have to love you because you're going to leave piles of sawdust all over the house. You're going to be gone on the 4th of July weekend because you're carving in the middle of a fair. But you get to travel all these luxurious places and these beautiful resort towns and you go just outside the city and you go into this field and, and you spend four days there and, and then you leave. <laughs> so I've, England has some killer fields, man. I've seen some awesome fields all over the world. But the, but the first thing you got to do um, is stay safe in your carving. It's, this is designed to keep you carving, is all this seminar is for. Uh, and the first thing is safety, okay? I wear chaps, glasses, muffs, and boots, okay? Um, the reason is, these are my chaps. Everybody, I've had people come up to me and say, hey, dude, I love your leather chaps. And I laugh. <laughs> Because they're actually orange. <laughs> they were when I got them. But uh, 
this I, I've gone through a couple pair of chaps, but these ones here are kind of fit and real nice. But does anybody want to put their body through the abuse that these chaps have seen in about five, six years? Seriously? This one here? That was an 066, man. Three foot bar? Bertha, I call it. I was coming down, slapping along log down sideways, chain through, come up between my leg, wrapped around my leg. All I had time to do was go, that's about, that, that was about it. Just kind of tilt the face and tilt the saw away from me so that curtain of chain could fly out. Dude, yeah, thank God I had my chaps on. You know, and there's another one too, that's a burn off the back of a heater or some or a torch. <laughs> That would have been an alley for a while. <laughs> so, so basically, dude, you wear chaps. Wear chaps. And if you see someone that doesn't have chaps or something, I mean, I keep spare pairs. I have a spare pair of Tom Earrings wearing right now. Um, wear chaps. Wear glasses. Okay? Because I love me. I love to protect myself. I love to see, so I wear my shades. I love to hear, and I love music. So I, wear, I protect my ears. Now the fact that I love you is pretty damn apparent too because I changed myself in because I know what an idiot I am. I know I'm a lunatic. I know stuff's going to fly off my saw. Okay? Protect the people around you and you will be surprised how much they know you love them by, you know, by doing that. And so, and safe, uh, now your all saws have a, uh, a safety guard on them. You know what I mean? You hear it click, you know, there's your safety. Stops that chain immediately. Uh, that's a good thing, but don't put yourself into a position. You know, the best defense for a punch is not be there when it lands, okay? Uh, don't, don't go in like this. Go in like this. Now if it kicks out, it's going to kick out over here, but don't recognize you're putting yourself into a dangerous position. Pay attention. It's all about paying attention to the situation you're in. Now what is the most dangerous part of this saw right now? Anybody? You. Yeah. Bingo! It's the lunatic holding on to the handle. He tells that saw. So that saw just sit on the ground if it wasn't for me. You know what I mean? But the second most dangerous part of a saw is from dead point tip to the top corner of that radius. Okay? When you hit that, it will, it can, most likely, it will come straight back on you. Okay? I use that part of the tip more in detail than any other part of the tip. Because there's something when you, once you learn to control that and keep yourself out of, the, out of the line, you'll get a float to the saw. That It's not a natural, it's not a purposed line. It's a natural line and you'll find it, it's like an S-curve almost and you can, it really, it adds to your detail. It does, it adds that little bit of a, I don't know, it doesn't look regimental. You know what I mean? That's actually a really nice part to detail. So, but if you do have to plunge cut, you don't plunge straight in, okay? Drop your tail. You drop your tail, you touch your tip. Once you're in there about two inches or so, you can pick that saw up and the only way it can possibly kick at that point is straight back. Okay, so you're, you're safe with that. So, but yeah. Seriously, that's, uh, that's, that's something to truly pay attention is watch that section of the saw and not put yourself into harm's way. Um, now, if you ask my opinion, this thing here is ten times more dangerous than that is. English Open two years ago, four injuries. All four of them, right angle grinders. Well, three injuries. I'm not counting fours. I don't even want to put a band-aid on it. But uh, I, grew, I, I, I had a groove. This this this. I grooved the inside of my thumb so deep I bought it Dave Flemings there. You can put a cigarette butt in the damn groove and you flush. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> but uh, yeah, so actually right angle grinders, it has no break. It's still at 5,000 RPMs and it's got a blade on the end of it that will chew a hole in anything. You included. Now the, there's another tool that I've seen fly up on Facebook a lot and I think it's... Uh, I, I, it, it, it spawned like uh, arguments that were 300 comments long. Sue Sullivan, God bless her. Uh, but what it is is the Lancelot. And it's a disc with chain going around the outside edge. 
I don't know who this sadistic son of a gun who was that invented that thing, but they, he should be shot. Because, uh, I mean, literally, that thing is just like, I, why? Why? Is there, is there some procedure you can do with that that you can't do with anything else? Really? I, 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 I'll take anybody on. If you can pull off a procedure with a Lancelot that I can't pull off with a chainsaw, then, I'll, then, I'll, then we can talk. I'll listen, because uh, i got to be honest with you. Everything I tell you today can't be argued. There's only three things I know in this world that cannot be argued. God is great, gravity works, and the sun rises in the east. Everything else is argued. You're, you're entering into something that has no rules. You know what I mean? We make up our rules and we change them at will, too. <laughs> but anyway, so, so chops, glasses, muff, keep yourself safe. And uh, move it up. All right, now, saw maintenance. If your saw is still running, you can carve, right? Uh, the, the, the big thing is to clean the saw. And uh, I didn't want to go trying to disassemble a saw completely here. Uh, so Ed kind of, we shot a video down in my shop uh, on how to clean a saw, okay? And uh, do you want to run that? Yeah. It's blocking the driveway. Read Mine? that. Read that. No, read it. Oh, black four-door Dodge pickup. <laughs> it's blocking the driveway. It's blocking the driveway. That's you. I didn't want you here anyway. Right? You know. But, uh, that's. Is it, uh, look, I thought I want a black four-door pickup. Right? <laughs> but here you go, guys. I don't go vocal on that. You're the vocal. I'm the vocal. All right, well, what I'm doing is, is uh, that is a brand new saw that's only been used maybe, uh, not maybe, maybe a week or two, a couple weeks. But what I was doing is we all do this, make planks. We take our saw and we go like this down the side of the plank. Did you, you ever do that? Oh, man, no, I'll get into that later. But what I did, that was what I did, was it creates a surface on the board, and I'm trying to show you the surface that it created. But all I did was surface that plank with that saw. Now, I want to show you what happens when you start to tear the saw apart. Everybody, when they, when they tear the saw apart, they always take this off, right? And you clean all that stuff out around your oiler, you know what I mean? Um, and you get all that stuff, and we blow it out in here, and then you go ahead and you take your... Take your uh, carb off or your cover off and you clean your air cleaner and stuff like that, right? Um, most people don't go into the next phase of it, okay? You're, you're only about a third of the way in, okay? Uh, first is your bar. You have to take a, there's a thing called a, uh, a bar rake. You can buy them, uh, you can make them. It's easier to make one than it is to buy one. Some of the still, uh, still uh, scrunches. Have, have a tapered tip on it. That's what that tapered tip's for, is to go down inside your bar. Okay? If this is a bar rake, okay, that slides down inside your bar and cleans that groove out. If you don't clean that groove out, that's where the oil runs that oils your chain. So nine times out of ten when people say, oh man, I keep burning bars. Well, did you ever clean it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because all you're doing is building up heat in there and your oil can't get through and it just sludges. Uh, I call it, you might be a jerk. Uh, when you're cleaning that out, if it's gold, you're a good boy. <laughs> if it's black, it should have been out of there a long time ago, dude. If you're finding black dirt inside your saw, you're a jerk. <laughs> These are your friends, man. Treat them as friends. And you can see here, I'm going through and I'm actually blowing the saw out. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you'll find in the end of this, the next step, now that we've cleaned the bar, cleaned all that out, cleaned the air cleaner, you still have, now you're halfway, man. Keep going. You, you'll never keep your kitchen clean if you don't sweep the front porch, all right? Here's your front porch. Every ounce of air that comes across that head comes through these fins. Now there's a little shroud in there to catch the oil particle dust crap. But what you're going to find is when I surface that board, just by walking up and going, wah, 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 I gained sawdust on top of my saw from using it sideways. 
And you'll see that here I have all that tore down. Okay? Now, a little later on in the video, you're going to see, once you take this off, I blew all that out and all this sawdust came out of there and all around the carburetor and everything like that, big long shards. Once I pulled all that out of there, it's clean now, right? I took these top three, three screws out of the top of the saw. When I pulled it off, there was a nest of sawdust about this big sitting on top of my head. Okay? You ask any saw dealer, manufacturer, saw mechanic, and he will say 99.9% .9 of all blown up saws blow up and sear on this right left hand corner, or the front left hand corner. Because that's where all the oil and nobody ever cleaned their front porch, man. If you don't, if you do that, I see a post on there, the guy said he was burning uh, three or four or five 180s and 170s a year. I get about two years out of the 170 or the 180, and the reason I use it, you know, there are better, smaller saws that will last longer, but there's no more common saw on the market, okay? I don't, if you're in Kentucky, in some backwoods town, and your saw pops, 200 bucks out the door, dude, take your parts off of it, turn it over into a dime tip, it takes five minutes to switch everything out, it can be done with a scrunch. You know, it's not a real hard thing to do. Um, is, but the still MS-170 and 180, that's why I use them. But when you buy a Zippo lighter, you expect it to last your whole life. You buy a Bic lighter, you know it's going to be gone in a month or two. That's what you're buying. The MS-170 and the 180 is a homeowner-grade saw, and it's a Bic lighter. It's going to pop, but it's so easy. Once you buy the, the parts that transfer it over, you're done. You know what I mean? You can run for decades on that. Um, but it's so fundamental to keep your saw clean. Uh, this should be done before every competition or and after every competition or every event that you do. Um, it's just the most fundamental thing is because if you keep the saw running, it'll keep feeding your family. Now the second thing is, the next thing I guess would be to keep it sharp, man. Uh, if saw ain't sharp, there's so many times that I see people using a really big, beautiful $800 saw, man, and they got a dull chain, and they're going vertically down through the end grain of a log, and the saw is just whining, crying. I, I, it's like Silence of the Lambs. I don't know whether to shoot the guy or shoot the saw and put it out of its misery, you know? But you, you can't. It, it's, you will save decades, just hours and hours of time. You take 20 minutes out and sharpen your saw, you just save yourself four hours. I mean, I know it's hard, to, your thoughts there, and you want to carve, stop and sharpen it. It happened to me yesterday, I put a fresh chain on, especially here when you're working in frozen material and there's ice and dirt clinging in the ice and rocks on there. Dude, I went down, I made about a half, made about a half tank of gas and that's all, or the other one over there, and I, uh, and I went ahead and <coughs> stopped. Shut the saw off, sharpened it. Went back. Before the tank was empty, I was pretty much done with what I was doing. You know what I mean? That bear playing a fiddle, uh, sitting on a hay bale. But uh, when you sharpen a saw, what you're looking at with a tooth, it's, it's kind of like it's a relationship. You have that tooth comes out like this, right? Drops off on the back. This scoops up, comes up, and makes a point, and comes back down. Now, the, this is called a raker, right? Raker tells a tooth. It's a relationship, okay? Um, it doesn't matter how long this tooth is compared to the one behind it, it can be shorter, whatever. As long as the relationship between the raker and the tooth are the set, are uniform, that's all we'll cut straight. It's not so that whole two strokes, two strokes, two strokes, two that's a that's a variable. There's a there's a line on that. But when you sharpen your saw, you can do it with a round file, you can do it with a goofy file, you can do it with a with uh with a dagger or the uh, Dremel tool and a 420 flat wheel, whatever way, whatever way is more comfortable for you. But what it comes down to is paying attention. You, you don't go up there and take a file and just go in there and say, I see God's doing this one here, next tooth. <laughs> Sharpening that chainsaw is like making love, okay? There's an intimate relationship between that file and that tooth. 
You, if you treated your woman like that, then you get slapped. <laughs> Seriously, get down and, and line it up your best. Take one nice, even stroke. And put your face down there, see what you're doing. There's a clean area, and there's a dirty area. The clean area is what you affected. The dirty area is what you need to clean up. Okay? And once you s just slow down for a minute, and just go through. And you, the first thing you should carve every morning is 32 teeth. If you carve them with the same heart that you're going to carve your bear with or your piece with, you'll be surprised at how fast your saw will run. And, and it's like all of a sudden I understand sharpening. Now all of a sudden you're paying attention. <coughs> okay? Because you need not just that point and that flat area across the top of it. Okay? That's not just the only thing that needs to be sharp. This needs to be sharp the whole way down. If you look at that tooth, it comes across and then it kind of goes like this. That this, if this isn't sharp, your, your, your bar won't, your chain won't cut a groove wide enough for your bar to fit through. Okay? Now, a little carver's trick. Take this raker and take what, a little Dremel tool with the little 420 wheels on them, you know, a little post and a wheel, and go in there and plane that down your raker will look like this on top. Take half of its distance off on this outside where the cove is. Now, all of a sudden, that side of that tooth, is, you can see something. You know, dang, does it make a difference cutting radius. Now your saw doesn't bind there near as much. Just push that raker over. And then James Link, now Link, never used one of his saws, dude, to cut ballistic, dude. <laughs> it's almost too fast. Okay, what he does is he pushes it over and sharpens it into a knife blade. Okay, when you push it, now you're splitting your chip in half before you take it out. And if you give any push, that raker will sink down in and take a bigger bite. It's a real quick trick. It's not knock the raker down. You don't just carve the raker down. A lot of guys just pile the rakers off, man. It'll go better. Dude, yeah, put bigger tires on your car, it'll go faster, too. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, the bigger, you know, the weight of the wheel and the extra rim, and you're not going faster. But that's a neat trick to learn with your thing. Another one is uh, cutting the heel off of your tooth. Now you're thinking, well, what's that going to do? That's the back end of the tooth. Where it comes into play is we play with the tips of the saws all the time. And if you look at the way that comes around, and watch a tooth. It comes around and it's cutting, it's cutting, it's cutting, it's cutting. Now I'm sitting on top of the tooth in a plunge cut. Now I'm sitting on the heel. Then it slams off the heel, slams into the chain, hits the next rake, grabs the next tooth. That's, that's why your saw is doing that. That's why it's kicking itself back out because it's, it's falling off there and slamming into the chain. It's too, too aggressive. When you do this, it passively lays the tooth back to the chain and is picked up by the next raker. And it's just like butter. Dude, it's nice. It calms your saw down. This takes a lot of the aggression out of your out of your tips. No, oh, by the way, the knife sharpening thing, don't do it to anything over a 16-inch bar. I did it to a 36-inch bar on Bertha, and I hung that chain in the back of my shop as a note to myself, never do that to the <laughs> saw again. I won't put it back on there, dude. That thing's dangerous. <laughs> but uh, but anyway. Uh, with that tapered back there, it'll, it'll really calm your tips down. It'll really calm your saw down. Um, that's, and note, since it only cuts its way in and then it sits on, that kind of explains why when you do a plunge cut, your saw leads up. Don't try, let your saw, leave room in your cut, come in low and let it, let it climb. You'll climb in faster. If you try to force your saw straight in, well, technically you are bigger than it. <laughs> You know what I mean? You can't force it. That's when the smoke starts coming out, you know, because you're trying to rub the dang wood out of the way. You see what I mean? So let your saw walk up when it gets into that plunge cut. How, that's why you see so many of the big carvers, you know, they, how did you do that so fast? You do it so smooth. Let the saw do what's a, what it wants to do and comply with your thought along the way. Um, now the big difference, that's another thing too I want to discuss with the bars. Um, what's the difference? This is a roller tip. Roller tips get tightened. 
that's kind of loose because it was laying. But they get tightened. They don't. They don't. Uh, they don't. They have to be a regular. The bar will be. The chain will always be in the bar because it's a roller tip. That's great. This is a hard nose tip. If you did that to it, it would last about 20 minutes, and you'd pull that right in there, friction. So that your your uh, hard nose tips you should run your chain just a tad. So that's actually a little too loose. But I was beating the hell out of her yesterday. But uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a good thing to do. Just one thing to remember with these, because you'll see guys running these loose. Don't do that. Don't do that because there's a ratio between this gear and your drive gear. And when you put that slack in the chain, it creates a variance in that distancing. And you'll chew the living guts out of your drive gear. Okay, who cares if you wipe out a bar? They're 20 bucks. Well, this one here is 100 bucks. <laughs> it's a cannon. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's another thing, too, is, is your bar width. You know, there's, there's the 05, 0 gauge. There's so many measurements that when it all gets kind of confusing, doesn't it? You know, what chain goes on what side, just, it's, there's, it's basically, you ready? Quarter pitch, three eighths pitch, three two five pitch, and then four oh four. Okay, and the pitch is the distance between the drive gears. The distance and the spacing between the drive gears. Now, three eighths pitch is kind of the variable one. That's the one that has all the varieties that lay in it. Okay, and 3 8 pitch is also as uh, you can get 050 gauge or 550 gauge chain, which is a standard normal chain, or there's an 043 gauge. And the basic difference is right there, if you want to look at these solos, this is 050 and this is 043. And I say the difference between the two chains is the difference between shoveling one path to the driveway, one shovel wide, or two shovels wide. If all you need to do is get to the mailbox, well, hell, one shovel will do. You know what I mean? It's a, it, it's a lot. When you go to the 043 gauge, you just, you just dropped your workload, dude. Your saw now has less work to do to make that cut, so therefore it will cut faster. Your saw will perform better. Okay? Um, but yeah, they're the basic two ones. And Mick Burns, my buddy Mick, so you'll see a little hole in these tips right here. Please your sprockets! <laughs> That's an old, a lot of the older members will catch that one, it's a Barry Pensky thing. <laughs> it was funny as hell. But it's Mick, he was, in, he was uh, picking on Mick and doing interpret, you know, impersonating Mick as greaser sprockets, because if you grease these here, the bars will, the bar tips will last longer. You know what I mean? And it's important to, when you run your bar and you run your chain, Every now and again, run your finger on the edge of that. If you feel that sharp, that burr there, just take a fly file and take that all off her. Uh, or your finger sander. Uh, not a right angle grinder. They heat it really fast. <laughs> just really fast. Too fast. But go ahead and get rid of that burr because what happens is that sticks out past the chain. That hang you up. It's out past the chain. Now the chain can't cut a groove wide enough for to fit all that stuff too. So. You just get rid of that and your, your bars will cut smoother, cleaner, easier. You don't force a saw, you ride the saw. Okay, there's another, there's another relationship for you. This is your friend. This is guy's an interpreter. Okay, you had a thought, there's a piece of material and this interprets your thought into the material. So don't fight it. Don't fight it. Just let, you know, I mean, when you, when you manhandle a saw, it'll take its mind and this might manhandle you back. All right, moving on. Where are we at? <coughs> All right, now that your saw works, it's clean and everything, and sharp. Uh, wood, need a piece of wood. What are good carving woods? Okay, there's a there's a scale. We tried to find it. We tried to find a scale that I had found one time, and I'm not real good on the internet, so I'll never find it again. Uh, but it was a scale, and what it did was they take a block of wood. And an exact measurement, six inches by six inches by six inches. Part of it is part of the radial grain, part of it is flat to the grain, and part of it is end grain. They measure it at green, fresh cut, dry it, and then measure the variance and how far it's shrunk in each one of those directions. Any wood that shrinks in equal amounts in all directions won't crack. 
Okay, what are these woods? What are these woods? Yeah, there's a diagram. See right here's your chunk. And you can see, when you get a plank and you look at a plank, at the end of the plank, oh, I shouldn't tell you this because now all the good planks will be gone. <laughs> <laughs> but when it has that arch in it, that's what your board's going to do. It's going to cup. Okay? There's a term called quarter sawn lumber. Okay? And quarter sawn lumber is when you quarter a log, take a board off one side, take a board off the other side, take a board off one side, take a board off the other side. That's what they make guitar faces out of and stuff. That's when there's the least amount of stress on the wood. Okay? Catalpa is one of those woods. But it's toxic. Does anybody here ever work in toxic woods? I, okay, right there you should have all raised your hands. I swear to, I swear to you right now, catalpa, walnut, uh, butternut, um, some grades of pine, okay? Uh, really hard on your lungs. Mahogany, mahogany dust will do damage to your lungs that is irreparable. The best surgeon in the world can't help you out. Okay? Protect your mouth, protect your lungs, and, and, and when you are sanding, uh, the big chips flying off a saw, okay, you should probably wear a mask, but I don't, I don't. But if I'm gonna do a bunch of sanding, mask on, man. Seriously? Uh, otherwise, like, catalpa will give you flu-like symptoms for about a week, yeah? Big major chest congestion, but it's all from the catalpa. So what you wanna do now, all the other woods that do crack, how do you get over it, okay? Well, if you honor the tree, if your charming is good enough, it won't crack. <laughs> but if it cracks, it means you got work to do. Now, um, when you cut a log straight off at the end, like a cookie, okay, it's going to crack from the center out. Well, catalpa won't, but that will crack from the center out. It's going to. It's a stress crack because the inside of the tree is drying at a slower rate than the outside of the tree. You know? Um, so how do you get over but do you, I don't know if y'all know this, you take a di diagonal baloney cut off a log? Did you ever see the carvings of the faces in the diagonal baloney cuts Yeah. You know why you do that? Because the log won't crack. You just reduced your cracking ability by 80%. The chance of it cracking just dropped 80%. Because of the way the grain is, the board can actually flex itself and then reform. You know what I mean? And it can float around. You'll notice a lot of times, a lot of my carvings, I work out of a half log. Learn to work from a half log. It's not only is it really convenient for benches, uh, but it also allows the carving to do this and flex into place and not get major cracking. Um, the worst place for it is the core. Don't, don't try not to put the face of the angel in the core of the tree. Try to keep the core of the tree out of the bear's face. If you can, shove it over or whatever. Just shift it out of there. Um, it's not just that it's crackability, but the very core of the tree, the tree was very young, and the wood is a different consistency and a mass than the rest of the wood. Okay? But if you, as, a, as a whole, you'll find that when, if you take and sand a piece of wood the, uh, it, on the flat grain, uh, you'll be able to find out real quick if the grain lines are the same density as the pulp in the middle, it's a good carving wood. But if like the pulp in the middle is real white and airy and the grain line's real hard, like spruce, you'll find that in spruce, it's gonna crack, dude. It's gonna crack. But God rest Jim Petroli, man, great carver, God rest his soul. He said if it doesn't crack in the uh, in one year, if this carving does not crack, you call me and I'll come crack it for you. <laughs> you know? Um yeah, I, I actually posted this on here. Uh, it's, it's on my Facebook page, if you all Facebook me, Timothy Clark. Um, it's a list of resistance to decay, because you're going to get stump cards. People are going to go, oh, yeah, well, what I do is I accordingly price it. This is going to last forever. <laughs> I make sure I reflect that in the bill, okay? And if I know it's only going to last about five, six years and rot off, you know, don't piss them off by charging them that extra three grand. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it ain't going to last as long. So, but nine times out of those woods are, are faster and easier to carve. They're softer woods. So you're really not, it's not costing you anything. You're in, you're out, you're done. You made your money. But, you, uh, but there's a resistance to decay chart. This book is uh, Bernard Mason 
This book is from like the early 1900s and it's one of the most wealth of knowledge that I've ever found in the whole damn, uh, a friend of mine bought it for 50 cents out of a yard sale and Mike McGuire looked it up on <coughs> eBay or something like that for $85. <laughs> so, but it's a good book. What's the name of the book? Ed Mason, uh, Woodcraft. But it's an awesome book. It has uh, everything in it from totem poles and, and council rings and tin craft and shelters for the trail. It has lists. Every axe you've ever seen in your life is listed in that book. And it tells you what it is, how, what it's called, how what it's supposed to be used for. It's a pretty cool book. Uh, it has all your firewood, best of your firewoods and, you know, I mean, most heat and all that stuff. So it's, it's, it's just a cool book, man. It's a whole wealth of information. But uh, now that you've got a good piece of wood, and you've got a, a you've got a a, a log or a, ple a piece to work out of. I, like I said, I like to work out of a half log because basically all the woods are already out of your way. That's the hardest part about carving is getting all that crap out of the way that you didn't need. <laughs> but if you just take, if you looked at the flat side of a log standing up, it would be like that, you know. Okay, you can knock a bear head in there, come down, knock in, back out for the paw, back in. Come back down, out, boom, bam. You know what I mean? You can just go boom, 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 make a couple notches, get some crap out of your way, and chase a bear head down through it. I start with the face, and I push back into the face, and then I run up around the ears, and I come around the back side of it and follow the body down. Now you can wrap that bear, okay, your log's twisted. Okay, twist your bear. Just, just keep running right around in the ring. If you find you don't have enough room for his butt, his butt's going to be really skinny. Huh. Increase the angle. Now your bear's up like this. Okay, there's always enough room for his log down there. There's enough room. I seen Bob King one time, man. And he carved a, uh, a ram, a mountain goat. <coughs> Bob was maybe this big around. He carved a life-size mountain goat. Twisted that damn animal up there like that, looking back over his shoulder, and I saw a gun, man, nailed the piece. But he twisted a life-size mountain goat, and it all got bigger out. You can twist it into your carving, and that's one of the things that, uh, that, that uh, when you're designing your piece, you see that sore on the eagle wing? There's your baloney cut. Boom, down through the log, come down through, notch out, leave a little undercarriage there, because you're going to have to need to go and eat legs. Come back in, come down to your rock, and move out. It's a simple, simple, actual piece. People think, oh, the soaring eagle. No, dude. Here's your first cut. Here's your second, third, fourth, fifth, and out. There you go. You've got enough rock down here. You see what I mean? Once you have that blade, and I'll have all the garbage out of your way, well, hell, turn it sideways, draw an eagle on there. <laughs> you know? It's, it's the easy part. Okay? Um, but uh, a cool exercise is to, uh, is to start, there's, it, you find one point and chase it, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's a neat trick I used to do with uh, kids and stuff for schools is you put your hand, I'd make them put their hand on the person's shoulder beside them and then close your eyes and you say, now put your hand on your head and they go like this and you say, back down to the shoulder and where's the elbow and you go like this. How did you know that was there? You had your eyes closed. It's the same thing. Start at the bear's nose, push back through his muzzle, meet his face, push into his ears, step around it, keep pushing in. Or if you're doing a, uh, a human figure, I kind of leave off the face because you block the whole piece at one time. Don't just go in there and put his shoulders on and start into the face. Don't ever do that to a carving. Okay? What happens is you get involved in that face and then when you try to fill the rest of the carving and you find out you don't have enough log, or worse yet, you got a bear with a really huge head. <laughs> you know what I mean? And little kids, man, but they're the honest ones. I swear to you, they'll come up to you in a fair and go, your bear's got a really big head. <laughs> one ear's bigger than the other one. I thought so too, thanks man, I'll kind of fix that. <laughs> you know? But they're honest, man, and they do make you bite it down, dude, you were wrong. <laughs> the kid was right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, learn from it. But uh, when you're designing your piece, you have to consider the crackability of the wood, okay? 
you can do like uh, block your whole piece. You got your log, block your bear in. Here's a neat one too, is uh, when you block your bear in, you come up and you take your bear off and you come in and you come down for the arms. You know, you're in there and you come down here and you put the legs in, okay? And here's the one that really kills me, is people go, now how do you carve a really big bear? <laughs> How big was the log? I never told you how big the log was. That one right there is only this tall. <laughs> but, and that's a fun one too at fairs. You say, I am going to carve a life-size grizzly bear represented this big. <laughs> they always laugh. And, you know, happy people spend money, dude. Uh, when was the last time you were really pissed off and started throwing money on the table? <laughs> yeah. I got that, well, you know what I mean? So just, just remember, don't dug your room with your clients. You know what I mean? No matter what, always you have to be a diplomat in this industry. You do. You are not only because when you walk out of the seminar and you're down under, you're representing it. You're representing the rendezvous. These people that come driving into town to see the chainsaw car and they look at you and go, oh. oh, oh. There's one of the carvers. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> they do, man. Do that again. <laughs> it's like rock star treatment, except for the money. <laughs> but um, so you are representing the, the the event that you're that. So let that reflect your actions. You know, really. And then now, especially the rendezvous, you're stacked in here with 186 other carvers, uh, and there's some strong personalities, man. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna eventually run into your polar opposite <laughs> you know hey buy him a beard walk away you know what I mean just you, you, you're gonna you have to be a diplomat you have to get along with everybody everybody has to get along because like I said we're the ones that everybody are watching so keep that in mind when you're when you're at any event all right now you got block form in there that's good <laughs> now you got a block form in there it's time to um, Chasing your details. Now, it's, it's kind of crazy. Your forming of your pieces next. Uh, when you come down across the back of that bear, you made a flat cut here, you made a flat cut there. Now your bear's head's kind of got these little corners up there. Get rid of all the corners. Get rid of all the straight lines. Okay? There are no straight lines in nature. Okay? Everyone says, well, what about still water? Now, seven miles out, she drops off the curvature of the earth, so even still water's not flat, dude. There is not to give the earth around. You know what I mean? But uh, there's no straight lines in nature, so get rid of those. There's no corners on a bear. And like Dayton Scoggins says, I hate bent bones. <laughs> bent bones, he's, he's, the arm was bent. He was like, the bone was crooked. <laughs> Don't even look at that stuff, he said. Only look at the good stuff. <laughs> Funny. But uh, so when you do you see what, now that you've you see this outline when you when you're doing this block form you got all the garbage out of your way and now you're going to start to form your piece I don't want you to look at the bear I want you to look at the outside edge of the line okay just like put your eyes in the center of the bear and, and every person every object every animal has a mass okay I can look out across that ground and say. You know, I can't see that far out, you know, because I'm nearsighted, but I look out and I say, oh, it's Pat Holbert. You know, in a blizzard, I can tell you it's Pat Holbert because of the way he stands, the way he walks, the way he moves. I know the man. That's where you start, that massive form. Once you nail that, now it's time to start detailing. You know what I mean? But when you, it's kind of hard to say, but you don't look at your piece, you only look at the area that it's taking up. You know what I mean? It's mass. It's, it's, the, the, I don't know how else to put that. Okay, once you have that, and it's, it's a sculpture, so you do have to walk around your piece and have that lines from everywhere. You can look at it and you go, well, why did it look really fat right there? And then you come up here, but it looks really good right here. Go in there and find it from another angle, and you will find where that needs to come from, you know, what needs to come out to actually pull your form in. And you know what? If you don't figure it out, put hair on it. 20 bucks says it'll sell before the end of the week. Yeah, if it doesn't, right, welcome on it. <laughs> Arnold Roll, dude. <laughs> so I told you, you'll pick up some tricks here, buddy. <laughs> but once you start, once you, when, uh, uh, one uh, extremely talented carver, uh, Tom Leischer, uh, he's an artist, all round artist master, literally degrees and shit. Uh, like Scott Dow, <laughs> degrees and the stuff. But uh, 
he uh, he said if you carve a bear, okay, with just muscles, no hair on it, carve it with no fur, and intentionally look at the muscle design of the bear and try to notch all that in there, then you fur over top of that. Wow. If you really want it to look cool, fur it again. You really want it to look fur it one more time over the end. You know what I mean? The last time you're just tapping little tiny ones. That way, because you're never going to come in at the same damn angle you was before. You probably can't remember the angle you was coming in with them before because the animal is so complex or whatever. So much area. But when you come back in from a different angle, you'll find that hair over top of hair over top of hair. Now it's starting to look like hair, dude. It's not look like somebody caught a bunch of lines in there. Says this represents hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which is cool. It's uh, there's there's every style of art is welcome. As I said, there, this, there are no rules, so nobody's doing nothing wrong already. You know, it's just designed to try to so you can get more from yourself. You know, of what you want. I've seen somebody that posted one time and said, you know, this is my third bear. This is what I want. This is what I've got. Like, what do I do here? What am I doing wrong? I said, well, you know, some people have that artist's eye. The artist's eye. God, God that guy, he just has that eye. Bless you. But, um, but when, uh, when it comes down to it, you know what that eye is? Reality. They see reality. You know what I mean? And you look at it, and it's all about the relationships and the reality. It's don't, don't just look at the eyes and say, I'm going to learn to carve eyes. I'm going to study eyes. No, nah, look at the relationships that the eyes have with the corner of the mouth. Look how they place to the, with the ear. And now you're starting to put those. It's the relationships between things. Look at the shoulder and the relationship from the shoulder to the front leg. Or how it comes out, because people always put shoulders on bears. I do it too, put them in bibs and stuff, you know. Bear don't have shoulders like that, man. He walks on all fours, so his shoulders, his body's designed differently. The muscle structure, the, it, when, you're, when you're designing your piece and you're designing your animal, he's got a bone structure, man. Do not put your animal into a position where it, it is physically impossible for that to happen, okay? Um, you can go out and buy the $80 artist guide to carving the North American black bear, the grizzly bear. It's a great book. But if you go out and spend $3 on a little children's book on animals, dude, they'll give you all kinds of fun facts about the bears. You know what I mean? Now you can actually put your bear into an environment in your piece and actually and not have it reaching up for a wasp nest. Uh, can't imagine a bear being that stupid, man. <laughs> That's a wasp nest. He knows enough to stay away from a wasp nest. He wants the honey that's inside a tree. <laughs> Dude, just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> and if you take a saw wrench, if you take a saw wrench and do like the little ones, the little side, and you sharpen it off with a Dremel tool, you can actually heat it up and stick it in there and like tap it with a hammer and you can make a honeycomb. <laughs> so there's a little trick for you. Your saw wrench is now your carving tool. <laughs> but, uh, Okay, so, oh, when you're blocking, when you're blocking and you're forming, you're using both sides of your bar. Okay, when you're detailing, you use one side or the other. If you're not using only one side or only the other, then you're still blocking. <laughs> Either that or you're cutting three-eighths inch grooves and something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but when you, when you go in square, you, you've got a groove. Going at an angle, you're, it's called a parting tool. You're cutting, you're cutting a V part in the wood. Um, depending on how far you lay your saw down, means this side is short and this side is long. But your saw, you see, when you draw, you can draw both sides of the human face like this, go a little back and forth. Now, if you're going to carve your human face, you got to flip your pencil over. <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? And uh, it, so you have to get, um, you're going to find positions you can't get to. I call them carving paradoxes. Okay, I carved my way into a situation that can't be carved. I've created a situation I can't touch. Okay, that's bullshit. There is a way in there. Sometimes it's like this. Okay, but it's the only way I can get it in there and get the saw around this object or that. So you are going to put yourself into some really kinky positions with a chainsaw. Um, be careful when you're doing that, but be expressive. You know what I mean? Uh, if it, I'm not saying don't do that. That would be wrong with me. Okay? I'm just saying, pay attention, you know what I mean? 
coming to a moment here where if you're not paying attention, you know, you might be sitting at the bottom of the cliff. You know, um, just, you know, so like I can't stress that enough, just recognize where you're at. But when it comes to blocking your piece and taking it to final detail, I mean, we are a something for not out of nothing kind of people, ain't we? God took a rotten log and made a bear. Uh, but I take these things, my buddy drops them off from uh, CSD. And I twist a piece into it. Twist the rose right into it, you see. Um, if you really look, when that's up there, I'll come in here under my rose bud. I don't come straight down. I can't. If I do, there won't be enough room for the leaf. Here, that would be a little stubby one. So I've got to angle back over this way to create enough material for that object. You see what I'm saying? To try to create enough room, and then I swing back out of it because there's no straight lines in nature. So to make a rose or a flower stem or a plant stem, try to make it cook it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the imperfections in life that we find perfect. Who's the chick with the mole on her? Uh, Christy Brickler or whatever, one of the models. Chick. Dude, that's, that's just sexy. <laughs> you know, it's a mole. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sure. something like that. But I'm going to go ahead and just hand these, or if somebody wants to look at these, they'll be up here. Does anybody want to see this? Yeah, we're passing out. Yeah, pass it out there, Grandpa. <laughs> but uh, once it's, you get it to that phase, then I take it to a grinder, and I go ahead and I run a right angle grinder with that cuts all bed on it. And now I formed it. This is the form of a rose. It's the basic. If you looked at it in the dark, and I only looked at the outside lines, you're getting close, okay? Then, once you step down into it, you start to use the finger sander and start to actually detail the rows and pull steps. And I call it the separation of church and state, right? Now, I'm serious. This is one of the most fundamentals in carving. This will crisp your work up and make it look punchy and snappy is there's a separation of church and state. I want to know where the leaf ends and the bloom begins. I want a definite line. I want to see the difference between the raccoon's paw and the tree. There is a line where that ends. Look at my shirt. There's a piece where my shirt is my shirt. My neck is my neck. There's a crisp line between the two. The separation of church and state. That's what all that detailing is all about. All right? And that one there is just kind of started into the details. And then this one here, I think, I busted the leaf off of. It doesn't mean you can't sell it. Welcome. Yeah. You know, say to you right now. Right welcome on it. $20. But, uh, and then once that's all detailed, then the burning and brushing and sanding is one of the, is really, man, I, I hate chainsaw only competition. I love chainsaw only, but give me chainsaw and a torch. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I want a torch because I want to pop my eyes. I want to, and, and because uh, a lot of times, unless you are a freaking chainsaw sculptor, you can't see the details that are on that piece until you pop them with, with uh, flame. Or some people use a dry brushing technique over to uh, Aaron. The way Aaron goes about them house, I hate competing against him. <laughs> but, uh, and then what you do is, this, believe it or not, that fantastic paint job, two spray bombs, man. See, when you added the carbon, from burning, when you spray the red part and it bleeds onto the green, and then you hit the green part and it kind of bleeds onto the red, but there's so much carbon present when you add the two colors together, it just kind of makes a darker red. <laughs> so literally, I spray painted that rose in 30 seconds. It's the, it, um, learn to, uh, like I said, there's no rules. So when you get into the finishing of a piece, and you're done sanding, and it's time to start colorizing your piece, break all the rules. Purposefully read the damn directions and refuse to follow them. <laughs> I do that. I've already shot paint up in the air and then stepped out of the way and put my carbon in <laughs> Let it fall down on it. That's going to look cool. Uh, it did. It was kind of gold fleck over it. It was, it was awesome. On the turtle shell, badass. Um, but, uh, so when you get into these colors and staining, now paints are kind of, I don't, I'm not, I'm not the guy to talk to about paint. I don't really understand it much, never played with it much, so I don't really go there. But I'm a cabinet maker's son and I understand stain. Stains and finishes, that's what I do. 
Uh, no. So you can take, when, when uh, people say, well, what color do you stain a tree? Six. <laughs> Six different colors I think I use on a tree. Okay, there is Cape Cod gray, there is natural light, there is teak, there's mahogany. And then there's two blends that I come up with that I actually added pigment to and I'm not sure what the hell to call them. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but you can actually go, if you have a friendly uh, paint shop or something in your town, uh, raw pigment. That's that machine with all the tubes on it and they mix your stuff out of it. Get a little bit of raw pigment. You buy it off of them. Take, take, bring your own baby food jar. <laughs> you know what I mean? They get like black pigment, raw black pigment. Did you add a little bit of that to some, some uh, interior, exterior spar varnish, some side and finish on it? Add that black pigment in it. Dude, you make a black bear at midnight. It's beautiful. And then it's got that sheen that, 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 that the fur has, that shine that you see on the animal when it catches light. It'll have that. So you can actually use and create your, like I said, there ain't no rules, dude. If you come up with a great idea and, you, you know, and it worked, share it. <laughs> it's what this, especially, it's what the voo's all about. But uh, now, this is, I went to England and I thought I am going to be carving against some of the most massive freaking names in chainsaw carving. God, for in London, really? I'm going to compete against Sebastian and freaking Mark and uh, Simon O'Rourke, Dave Flemings, Will Lee. Does the half the carvers are here, you know? This is scary. I thought, but I'm going to learn something, man. I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to come back such a better carver from this experience. And I did. And I found a lot of information off these guys in the field. You know what I mean? And I learned they inspired me. They broadened my sense of what I daydream about. Okay? But I found the true wisdom in a pub. <laughs> <laughs> and these were the beer coasters that were laying on the freaking thing. There is only one you for all the time. Fearlessly be yourself. You know what I mean? Nobody wants, you know, copies. Be yourself. The world worships the original. Nobody wants a copy. Is that a copy? No, I'll take the original. Yeah, how much is the original? If the copy is this much, how much is the original? Be your original. All right? <laughs> oh, and you have to develop a style that suits you and pursue it, not just develop a bag of tricks. Always be yourself. Well, that was kind of confusing a little bit because we kind of live off that bag of tricks <laughs> and develop that bag of tricks. But know that that's just a bag of tricks. It's not the essence of sculpture. Okay. Uh, yeah, anybody in here can crack out a bear in 20 minutes. You know, it's okay. You know, we're all good. Now, you do that. Bears pay bills, man. <laughs> you shut up, carve bears. But make sure you five or six sitting there. And then go off and carve an angel or an alligator or two cranes taking off or a peacock with its tail swooping down. You know what I mean? Let your, let your imagination go and do it in your way. Okay? Um, I travel with Thor all the time. There's no way I could, I could ever reproduce some of that, those, that flat leaf stuff he does. Dude, he'll take a piece of wood two and a half inches thick. Have you looking 40 miles at a mountaintop <laughs> and seeing the forest in the background and then the closer forest with the waterfall that comes out and comes down and goes past the cabin with a light on it. And you're going, <laughs> God, dude, <laughs> I, I, I can't see that. I can't do that. But he's himself. I, I do other stuff. Please be yourself. I mean, but do yourself a favor and take a little piece of every person that you meet here at the Ville. Take them home in your heart and let it affect you and affect your work. It's, it's amazing where you can go with that. Now you got to market this stuff. <laughs> That's a nice trailer. Will you take a bear for it? <laughs> Don't laugh, but you probably go out there. There's a fair amount of carvers that will give you so many bartering stories. It's, it's freaking unreal. Actually, my last trailer I got for an angel. You know what I mean? My, uh, my red Jeep. I paid the last thousand dollars off with an owl, two owls in a tree, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, the car dealership was like, man, your work's amazing, just, you know what I mean? Be Always be willing, and uh, you know what I mean, be, to trade off a of carving because it's an automatic sale, dude. And it's not just an automatic sale, it's an automatic sale that the money is all spent on something that you desperately need. It's a step forward, you gotta invest it to get it, you know what I mean? 
Um, and when I say that, dude, you'll realize that when they say, oh, you get to travel down to North Carolina to a competition. Do you know what I hear when they say that? <laughs> okay, I need 600 bucks. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> to get down there, uh, that, that'll be fuel and that'll take care of me in the first couple of days. Are there, are there other sponsor cards? You know what I mean? Because everybody wants to host an event, but you gotta, it's got to be economically viable for you. <laughs> Exposure is one thing, you know what I mean? That's great, but I don't want to be famous. I want to be anonymously rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay? No, like, and, and where are you carving at? Where are you, here in the United States, eagles and bears. Over in England, owls and hares. I was up in Scotland, I asked a car, I said, what are you doing? He says, thistle. <laughs> you know what? Thistle. You know the thistle that grows? I'm going I'm to do a giant thistle. <laughs> and that's, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here from Pennsylvania going, and that's a marketable thing? <laughs> really, this is going to do well at auction? Damn, man, he made some cash off of it. He really did. But he's carving his area. Don't carve a silo on the outer banks of North Carolina. Switch it around, make it a lighthouse. <laughs> Vice versa in Iowa. Uh, by the way, if you're ever in Iowa, light silos sell. And if it, it seriously, and if they don't, right, welcome down to front. <laughs> Dude, it could be gone in 20 minutes, man. I love that. That's so original. <laughs> We are, we are right there. It's, I, all the original pieces are sitting over there, like the bear looking up out of the stump. <laughs> That's so original. Oh, God. I'll never forget the day I did my first one, and I thought, man, that's a really cool idea. <laughs> then I came to Ridgeway a year later and was like, that so was not my idea. <laughs> so if you see somebody else doing a piece that you thought of, chances are, you know, <laughs> I don't know, there's a shitload of us and there's, we've been doing this for 30 years, guys have been in it for 30 years, I'm sure that thought ran across somebody's mind at some point, so don't really, <laughs> nobody owns daydreams. <laughs> but, uh, staying alive, man, I'd rather have, you kind of, I was going to get you to change that, but uh, I'd rather have a tank of gas than a bear in my truck. I have traded off. <laughs> Almost, kind of. I sold it to the guy at the pump beside me and then used that money literally to win a pay for the gas. So it's kind of like trading off for a tank of gas. But yeah, I was randomly traveling to an event. Uh, I think it was uh, Southern Virginia. Just pulled in for fuel. Dude sold him a bear, literally took the freaking money, never took it, never put it in my pocket, walked in and paid for my fuel. But uh, yeah, um, when, you, when you really think about it, uh, have small pieces. If you're gonna survive in this industry, it's really nice to sell that deer jumping over a fence for four grand. It's really nice to have that big bear sitting there. You know what I mean? I gotta be honest with you, you have to transport that damn bear. Before you do that, you gotta load it. Uh, then you gotta strap it down, carry it here, get it off the truck, and then you gotta find a person who has $1,800 to blow on a bear. Because I gotta be honest with you, Art is born of lazy men during good economic times. <laughs> if you're starving, you're probably hunting bear and not carving them. <laughs> okay? Uh, so just know that. Okay? You need a roof over your head. You need a warm house. You damn sure don't need an eagle in the front yard, but you're really cool. <laughs> that's, where our, that's where our market lies. We know that. Okay? Um, and I'd rather, I'd rather sell a bear or I'd rather sell a piece cheaper than, than its value to someone I know who's going to honor the piece, who's going to appreciate the piece and take care of it. I put my heart in there, man. I put my heart into that piece. And to have somebody go, oh, yeah, that's awesome, sit there and they rot. So that's kind of harsh, you know? I did a fairy, fairy princess, nude fairy with her wings out and she's kind of standing like this, you know? And, uh, Princess of Baby Swans. I called her the Eaglet Princess. Gorgeous. Could have sold it for $2,800. Excuse me. Uh, I could have sold it for $2,800. I didn't. Do you know why? He was going to hang her outside in his garden. She says, nah, she deserves to be inside. Can't do it. Sorry. I won't let you have my heart to go have it swing around on a freaking thing and beat the wings off now. Wonder on. <laughs> See guys, I told you there's no rules and you are the your artwork is what you say it's worth. Because you know your artwork. 
whatever it's worth whatever you can get them to pay for it okay but you can always work down so start up you can't work up that's kind of a bitch unless you're like one of them sober tongue people but uh what is art it's any thought that you had you can think something i, I do it all the time i create food I love cooking, so I create food while I'm, while I'm carving. I'm like, dude, I'm like taking them up, brown up some sausage, you know, some hot sauce, and I start creating dinner in my mind, and I get home, and I was like, dude, I'm, ask my son, I'm badass, do it, dude. You know what I mean? But it's a creation. I had a thought. I had a thought today, and I'd like you to experience my thought. Either listen to it, feel it, uh, you know, smell it, whatever, uh, walk around it and view it. Whatever your thought was, that's, all, that's what art is. I had a thought and you brought it into a tangible idea, so a tangible substance that everybody can view, or experience, rather. Okay, so just know that that's art. You know, people go, you see, that's not art. Yeah, it is, it's just art that you don't like. Because <laughs> seriously, if I carve something uh, that, that really pisses you off, I still won. I provoked emotion from you. I took a piece of wood and manipulated it to piss you off. I won. <laughs> I'd rather make you smile. I'd rather make you go, wow. Or better yet, freak out or something. But I don't, you know, I don't really seek to anger anybody, but I just want to let you know that if you carve somewhere, you have an idea and you lay it out there and everybody says, now that's vulgar. Dude, you won. Don't worry about that person. They just have a different parameters on their mind thought. Let, everybody's entitled to their own thoughts. All right, pricing. Like I said, I'd rather have a tank of gas than a bear in the bed of a truck. Uh, you'll find that at the end, people will wait. Don't lose heart. People will wait to the end of the show and think they can walk around here on Saturday and offer you $50 for a $250 bear and you're a starving artist and you're going to take it. No, I think not. Don't. Stand your ground. Trust me, you'll lose a lot of stock. And then you'll lose a lot of stock that's in your trucks now that ain't going to go back home. Okay? Stand your ground on that because there are people that will do that. But they still want something, so they are going to buy. In the end, they'll end up paying a little more money to at least, you know what I mean, to get your money out of it. And now the last thing I want to want to talk about is competitions because everybody gets into this whole cost thing, you know. Um, Masterpiece carving, you got a limited amount of time to do a complete piece, okay? Forces the best of your ability. You will put yourself through living hell before you'll back off. I don't care if it's raining, dude, think about another job because you carve in 110 degree weather, you carve in... 10 below zero. You carve in <laughs> rain with no canopy. You, if you're in a competition and the bell goes off, baby, hey, pick it up or get out of the way. You know what I mean? Last year in Scotland, first two hours in the downpour of rain in the Highlands. People say, man, that must have been really hard to carve in the rain. And I'm like, I didn't really notice it was raining until the horn went off and I stopped and now I'm freezing. <laughs> you know, started putting gear on Jason. Jason Stoner was with me up there. I, I was, that was just, uh, it's, it's a, it was a beautiful trip. And it was like, hell yeah, I got the car in the rain in the highlands, you know. Something to put in your notch, in your belt, you know. The competitions shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't affect your ability. It shouldn't affect the way you see yourself. Whether you take first or last, do not believe them. If they tell you you're the best in the world, don't believe them. They're lying to you. Dude, if they tell you you suck, tell them no, you don't believe them. Do not base your self-worth from the opinion of five people on one afternoon. <laughs> really? Who the hell are these people? <laughs> really? So whether you take first or last, say, hey, man, I had a great time. I love the chicken. <laughs> I'm out. You know, made some money. You know what I mean? Smile, say thank you, or either way, you know, don't worry. It's don't, don't place value on that. You know, it's kind of nice winning trophies and free chainsaws. You're like, yeah, free chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> kind of excites you a little bit, but it's kind of. But that's what you should be going for. It's not the fact that, you know, I get blood and shit out of him. Either. But egos, egos are the first thing to destroy everything. Just, just remember that, and starting with yourself, <laughs> egos will destroy the carver.
And because uh, you'll do really good one year and win like four or five comps or place at four or five comps, and the next year you couldn't get in the top three to save your ass. Eight comps and you still haven't placed, and then you're like, well, they all hate me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, that's it. <laughs> we all hate you. You got any more beer? <laughs> <laughs> now, quick cars. That's the other half of these competition things. You hear quick cars? We're going to be doing quick cars down at the other end of town here later on in the week if we have enough logs left. Okay, Friday and Saturday. It'll be half hour quick cars. Half hour, you're in, you're out. We auction them off immediately afterwards, and you get 80%. The other 20% goes into the cost of the logs, boot, all that stuff. Okay, so it's, you know, it's a way to throw in a couple extra bucks for half an hour of your time at the end of the week, you know. And give it a half hour and walk away. I don't know, what's it worth to you, 100 bucks? You make 100 bucks in a half an hour, you just kind of giggle. Uh, that's actually one to go through in your life. Do, take the job, divide it down by your hours, okay, and see how much you're making. Just for shits and giggles sometimes. I actually worked it down to a per minute price because a lot of carvings don't take a whole hour. And when you tell somebody, it's like, well, I, I charge $3 a minute. <laughs> what? Did you hurt her? <laughs> really? Think about it. Think about 20-minute bear. Okay? I sell that for 100 bucks. I'm actually charging more than, <laughs> more than $3 a minute at that point. I'm up around 450 You know what I mean? A minute. But that's what it sells for. You see what I'm saying? So, when, just for your own little shits and giggles, work out your per minute price, man. It's kind of it's hilarious. It, it kind of makes you smile in the end, and it just makes you smile. But this quick carving thing. Um, to purposefully go in and quick carve a piece is the stupidest thing on planet Earth. It is the fastest way in the world to make a piece of shit. <laughs> Honesty. Now, I, I, I love quick carve competitions because there's a lot of pieces that I can do so efficiently. I don't, carve, I don't carve them fast, I just do them efficiently. And once you, uh, like in the immortal words of Bob King, quit cutting the scrap in half before you take it off the bear and it goes a hell of a lot faster. <laughs> Literally, you can go in there, block efficiently, form efficiently, detail efficiently, and say, wow, I still have time left. <laughs> cool. You never worry. Don't quick carve. Don't intentionally quick carve. Just carve efficiently. And that, when you're quick carving, you're all... You, that's when you get hurt. That's when shit gets freaky. And you're standing in an arena, you know, five feet away from me and four feet away from him. So you, you relax, you go into it, and you just, just, just carve. Calm down. If you really want to carve fast, relax. Don't, I mean, because I see people up here... You last about 12 minutes, man, you're done. Your hands go numb on you. Let that saw float. Just keep it in a position where it can't kick back on you. Keep a hand on top and let the saw float and relax when you carve and you can carve a lot longer. A lot longer. That's how you get through the competitions and the, and the hard events and stuff. Just stop yourself. Literally, consciously go, okay, I'm, oh wow, I'm all tensed up. I just want to relax and, and you'll find that the carving goes faster too. It's it's, it's really crazy, but uh, so yeah, man. That's about all I got to say. So <laughs> thank you so much. A uh, little bit of paint pops, right? Well, you can take that to any level. Is it done yet? You can always take a carving to a, another level and another level and another level and keep going. And so uh, a, a friend of mine here, Miro. Miroloff, Chernovsky did this piece. It's got 140 hours in it. Oh, dude, no, it's just a relief carve. Oh my God. Just a relief carve. But so uh, I'm gonna look at it and say it's about a piece of inch, maybe seven eighths inch thick. Isn't that freaking amazing? This piece is for sale. Starting the bid at 1800. <laughs> I was just, I was just dropped that gorgeous piece of work, man. Who did this? Love Tronovsky. Right over here. From Slovakia. He's right back here. Oh, he's down there carving. This is Igor. If you would like to talk to Miro, he's down uh, in the record parking lot. Uh, the checks are down there. I think uh, 
Germans, English, you guys are going to be down there, aren't you? Yeah, all it's, you of, know, all international the international base down, down, there. down there like that. And if, if uh, Miro is uh, wearing a red coat, and walk up to him and look him in the eye and then turn your head and go, Igor! Because <laughs> Miro doesn't speak English. He's a super, super. <laughs> and don't drink the Czech moonshine. Good <laughs> night.